Now, what is the diagnostic workup that you are going to do? We will be dividing it into two parts, first line investigation and second line additional investigation. So, what are the first line investigation? Any seizure in a newborn, what investigations have to be done? These are the first line investigations. So, be very clear. First is first line investigation like you will go on for checking for blood sugar, serum sodium and serum calcium, right? You will go on for checking, uh, you go on for doing a CSF examination to rule out meningitis. So, you will do it basically to rule out meningitis. According to AIMS protocol as well as Nelson, there are uh, a few areas where CSF examination can be skipped. What are the areas where it can be skipped? Where you are sure that meningitis nahi hai and the likely uh, cause is something else. It can be temporarily withheld in case of a very sick child. A child having severe uh, cardiorespiratory compromise or just undergone a resuscitation, you would postpone CSF examination. You will withhold it for a few hours till the child is stable. But it can be permanently skipped in case there is a evidence of HIE in the child. Like for example, there is a patient who is having a low APGAR score. One minute score is not uh, that, that important, although we do take it. But a child having a low APGAR score at 5 or 10 minutes associated with evidence of low pH or base excess that is increased base deficit in the umbilical artery. If, if, if such evidence is present then obviously you don't need to go in for CSF examination unless there is something else which tells you that it is unlikely to be HIE uh, and it additionally a component of uh, meningitis will be there. So, CSF examination will be needed in all except proven HIE in the patient, right? Then you will do a transcranial ultrasound. MCQ on this has been asked in the entrance exam. Neonatal seizures happen in a preterm child admitted in a ICU on day 2 of life. What is the next imaging investigation you will do? The answer is transcranial ultrasound. Transcranial ultrasound can not only detect the presence of uh, significant meningitis, uh, transcranial ultrasound is non-invasive, it can be done on a bedside and uh, particularly between day 2 to day 7 you will have intracranial hemorrhage happening and transcranial ultrasound has a high sensitivity to detect intracranial hemorrhage like IVH as well as intraparenchymal hemorrhage. But the problem is, it is it cannot detect subarachnoid hemorrhage. It cannot easily detect extradural hemorrhage. For that, you, if you are suspecting these two, then you need to go in for other investigations like um, CT or MRI. Then you will do a EEG in the patient. EEG is very, very important. Let us discuss a few points related to EEG. EEG is a first line investigation in any neonatal seizure. Now, broadly speaking, there are three types of EEG that you need to know. The first type of EEG is the routine EEG. The routine EEG is sensitive, but uh, routine EEG we say when the duration of the EEG recording is about one hour. The second type of EEG is called as continuous EEG. Ideally speaking, continuous EEG should be 24 hours, but in general we say when the EEG content, uh, recording is consecutively for more than 3 hours, we say it is continuous EEG. Ideally, 24 hour EEG recording should be done. Continuous EEG is considered to be the gold standard investigation in patients of neonatal seizure potential MCQ point, which is a gold standard investigation continuous EEG. And the third variety is amplitude integrated EEG. Amplitude integrated EEG. In short, it is written as AEEG. Certain books write it as AIEEG. Amplitude integrated EEG is a modification of the routine EEG and it has a good prognostic value 
as well as it is relatively easier to interpret. Even a relatively young resident who is not that well versed in reading EEG, that also even a first year MD resident, if provided you teach him the basics, he can easily identify that a particular seizure has happened in amplitude integrated EEG. But its overall sensitivity is variable, operator dependent and less compared to the routine as well as continuous EEG programs. So what are the things about EEG that you need to know? First thing is, whenever you do a conventional EEG, when I say conventional, we are talking about a routine EEG as well as a continuous EEG. On con conventional EEG, if it is done in the ictal period, when the seizure is happening, it can tell you about the type of seizure, it can tell you about the duration of seizure and it can tell you about the likelihood and it will tell you about the likelihood that whether it is a single activity or multiple such activities have happened by looking at the previous EEG recordings which are there but which may not have any clinical associated motor movements. For example, there may be some uh, dissociation activity which might be there. So it tells you about, uh, in the ectal period, it tells you about the seizure. Even in the interictal period, if you find that there is abnormal electrical activity, for example, burst suppression pattern you find, this will indicate that there is a risk of adverse neurological outcome in the baby. And so, interictal period EEG also tells you about prognosis over long term period in the child. So that is why conventional EEG is needed. Now as regards the amplitude integrated EEG, what is amplitude integrated EEG? In amplitude integrated EEG, we do not record the entire EEG from all the electrodes. We take the recordings from a limited number of electrodes. Usually what we do is we take one to two channels and total number of electrodes selected are two to four electrodes, not all electrodes. They are selected. From these readings, the readings are amplified, filtered and compressed. And then they are recorded on a, they are projected on a logarith semi-logarithmic scale. They are projected in such a way that about 1 millimeter of that amplitude EEG recording is equal to 1 minute of EEG recording, 1 minute of activity in the amplitude integrated EEG. This is one important thing, this is mentioned in Flohertie that you need to remember potential MCQ on this can be asked. So how would you identify that a seizure is happening in, in amplitude EEG? So if you have an amplitude EEG and the seizure activity is coming something like this, L like suppose you have the, let, let us try to, let me try to show you what is the kind of activity you will find. Suppose this is the kind of activity which you were finding. And suddenly what happened was, Did you find, did you see what happened here? Look at it here. The lower margin as well as the upper margin, they both got elevated. This is the time period during which a potential seizure activity can be identified. Right? So this is the interpretation only by looking at the electrode, even a non a uh, neurologist can also broadly tell you that something wrong is happening and a potential seizure has happened in this activity. AIMS protocol says that both upper and lower borders are elevated which is actually the case but if you have to comment upon one an examiner MCQ examiner asks you to pick one which is more sensitive elevation of lower border is found to be more indicative than simply elevation of the upper border right so elevation of the lower border baseline say if it gets elevated and then comes back to baseline that entire period is the period during which potentially seizure has happened because now you need to understand that this amplitude EEG needs to be correlated with a conventional raw footage of a normal EEG. 
This is because suppose there is a newborn lying down and you try to do suction in the child. So while doing suction, artifacts similar to this can also be produced. Another scenario, amplitude EEG, you have put electrodes mainly in the frontal and temporal region. These are the two sites where they are commonly placed. But suppose the child is having seizures mainly in the occipital region. So they might be missed also. So that is why amplitude EEG overall sensitivity is less. It is more useful as a, Nelson also says it is a adjunct to conventional EEG. Right? What are the limitations of amplitude EEG? It can, it can miss certain focal seizures where the electrodes are not placed. Secondly, it can produce artifacts and so it needs to be correlated with raw footage of conventional EEG, right? Also remember that amplitude EEG can be prognostic also. Because this can also tell you about, it can also tell you about burst suppression pattern. Right? So how to identify this? This can be, please remember this image. I did not want to show you any actual image. You get any image in the exam and they say amplitude EEG and this kind of a thing is being produced. Think of potential seizure. But remember that it is a potential seizure. It can also be. A artifact produced due to suctioning, extensive movement uh, or some painful procedure being done in the child, they can also produce a similar finding sometimes. Obviously, when you correlate that with the normal EEG finding during that, that, that point, you can easily perform and in case of any doubt, you need to perform a 24-hour continuous EEG monitoring, preferably with the video recording, with the so-called video EEG, where you can correlate with the actual physical manifestations also, whether it is only electrical activity or clinical syndrome is also getting produced. And then what are the additional investigations also called as second line investigations that you will do. So you will do a hematocrit. Hematocrit will be done in case you are suspecting polycythemia. You will do a total serum bilirubin in case you find that unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia related acute bilirubin and keftopathy is the likely re reason. Serum magnesium levels will be needed. It is a second line investigation and usually performed in patients with hypocalcemia because hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia tend to occur together. Then ABG and anion gap will tell you the presence of acidosis or not. And workup for IEM will be needed, especially serum ammonia and uh, urine ketones you will watch out for. This ABG and NAND gap and workup for IEM will be needed when the seizures are associated with clinical syndrome like vomiting, poor feeding and altered sensorium. These are the patients in whom you will do these two set of additional investigations. Then you will do a TOT screen if any evidence of uh, intrauterine infection in the mother, uh, mother is gaya. Then you will do a TORCH screen if you are suspecting any TORCH infection. You will do additional neuroimaging, CT and MRI. When will you do them? CT will be done in suspected SAH or SDH because I have told you that they cannot be diagnosed easily by uh, transcranial ultrasound. And intrauterine infections also you will do CT. In intrauterine infection you will watch for cerebral calcification. You already know that periventricular calcification will be seen in congenital CMV and diffuse cerebral calcification commonly seen in toxoplasmosis but can be seen in uh, congenital toxoplasmosis but other things also rarely can be seen. And then MRI you will do for uh, in patients of HIE and neuronal structural defects but MRI obviously should not be done in a extremely sick child. It is a diagnostic workup but uh, until the patient is stable you are not going to perform MRI in the patient. Thank you.